legislators are still trying to absorb the details of the complex plan to fund a $1 billion transportation package, and critics are starting to speak out. At their state convention, Democrats make it clear that the governor and GOP leaders will have to work to earn their help on key legislative proposals. And Alan Peake faces new critics as he expands the list of conditions that would be covered by his medical marijuana bill. Lawmakers starts right now. Good evening and welcome to Lawmakers. I'm Bill Nygut. We're at day nine of the 2015 legislative session. Tonight we're talking transportation. There's a proposal to raise much needed funds by appropriating the state excise tax, but some local municipalities are stomping on the brakes over that plan. That and more is up for discussion with our panel tonight. But first, let's check in with Pat St. Clair for tonight's Capitol Report. Hi, Pat. Hi there, Bill. Well, as you know, there are many moving parts to the proposed transportation funding bill. We sat down today with the bill's sponsor, House Transportation Committee Chairman Jay Roberts, and with Senator Tommy Williams, who is chairman of the Senate Transportation Committee. We'll have our conversation with Chairman Roberts in a few minutes, but first, Williams says when his committee members start reviewing the bill, he wants to make sure they understand the complex funding formulas and especially how they impact local governments. What we need to consider before we pass a bill is how this affects all these counties and cities, how it affects the revenue, who collects the revenue, where the revenue goes when it's collected, and how does it get back to DOT and to the, to the locals when they are wanting to build out uh, you know, capacity or transit or whatever it might be. So I want my members to first understand how we collect the tax, what the tax is, where it goes, et cetera. Half of the proposed $1 billion in transportation funding would come from gradually shifting taxes already collected by local governments to the state. Mass transit is also a major part of the transportation bill. William says he is generally in favor of the proposal for a $100 million bond issue to pay for mass transit improvements across the state. We hadn't fleshed out, you know, who's going to decide what projects are viable. I'm guessing DOT is going to be involved in that, but, um, but I, I support that. Whether we got $100 million or what that number is going to be is, is still up for the budget committee to decide, but I think it's, I, I'm glad we're lo looking at funding some transit. And now on to House Transportation Chairman Jay Roberts, who, as I said, is also the bill's sponsor. First, we wanted to know exactly what the bill, as proposed, will do. This bill, the, the easiest way to describe it is we are moving from a sales tax to an excise tax in the state of Georgia when it comes to motor fuel. And, and we believe that the Constitution is clear that all motor fuel collected by the state of Georgia shall be spent on roads and bridges. And so we're moving to that excise away from the sales tax. And we believe that in the future that will give us sustainability and it will also give us reliability, especially from the consumer who's out there right now that's used to price going up and down and fluctuating with right now the sales tax component, which is based off the average price every six months. Um, I'm sure you've gotten some response since your initial um, um, release of the bill. So um, how are you feeling? What are you thinking? Uh, you know, right now it, it seems to be going well. I think the discussion is starting. I think that's where we needed to get to. And, and now we've started that discussion. And we're listening to those who have concerns. And um, we're taking into account their concerns and trying to move forward to see if we can't rectify any concerns they might have. We talked a little bit earlier with um, Senate Chairman um, Williams, uh -huh. and he said his concern is that the lawmakers might not really understand it because it's such a complicated bill. Is that something that you've been hearing as well? The majority of our members, you know, try to sit there and, and reason through it, and even I, who have been chairman for several years now, sometimes have to go back and rethink how do we actually get to where we are today. You know, we have four actually taxes on motor fuel. You have a, a you have an excise tax, you have a three cent sales tax, and then you have a one cent sales tax that goes into the general fund that doesn't go to GDOT, and then you have the local 
sales tax. So, and then try to figure how all those are figured. It, it gets complicated. So are you going to do anything, bring people in or do anything to try to help people understand it a little better? Sure. I think if uh, one, I have met with our, our caucus, uh, talked to them about the bill uh, a couple of times. I have met with our little caucus huddle that meets in the morning times. Uh, I've met with our leadership and our chairman and discussed with them. I've also met with the Democrat caucus. Are you getting a little bit of pushback on the Democrats, particularly when it comes to the um, hundred million dollars that uh, could be allocated for transit? You know, uh, I think we had a good meeting the other day. Uh, if you listen to a lot of them, they say that you know this is a good first step in starting a discussion. Uh, to those that say, you know, we're only putting a hundred million into transit, I would say, well, what have we been putting in there in the past? Now, when you announced the bill, you said we're looking to fund transportation for a billion dollars without raising taxes, state taxes in particular. Right. Some people are saying that's a bit of a shell game, it's a bit of uh, um, the way that it's worded, but can you just speak to the issue of taxes being increased? Because it seems like municipalities will actually have to increase taxes. Well, from, from the local standpoint, it, that, that's up to them. They have the right to whether to impose or not impose. We at the state are saying that we're going to not, anything you're getting charged today, we're not increasing that from the state standpoint. Now, the bill has been formally presented and assigned to committee. Robert says it will probably be a couple of weeks before hearings are underway. He also concedes that there is still a lot of work and negotiating to be done. So, of course, it could be a very different transportation bill that ends up on the governor's desk. That's it for us here, Bill. We'll see you again right here tomorrow. Thanks, Pat. It was great to hear from both of those gentlemen about the bill. Obviously, we're going to be hearing a lot about transportation during this session. So let's get into it again with tonight's panel. They are Howard Franklin, a Democratic political strategist who also lobbies on health care and technology issues. Buddy Darden, senior counsel of McKenna, Long & Aldridge, a former Democratic member of the U.S. House. He's also a member of the board of directors of the GPB Foundation. Jim Galloway, longtime political reporter for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. His political insider column is must-read reading every day. And Eric Tannenblatt, one of the most highly respected advisors to GOP candidates at every level, from local to federal. So, transportation, we're, we're going to talk about this a lot during uh, the legislative session. Even We're going to talk about this more than people are going to be talking about Seattle making the wrong call at the end of that game. <laughs> Although I think that might last as long as this will. So, Jim Galloway, let's get it started. Where do we stand after a weekend in which legislators have had a chance to go home? They may have talked to county officials at home, municipal officials. Where do you see things right now? We are in an extended digestive mode. <laughs> we have uh, we we have we we have we have swallowed the bill. Uh, we have gone home and and listened to to official them to see how how it uh, how it uh, how it uh, sits with them. We've had a couple of counties, uh, my my county, uh, Tim Lee, chairman of the commission there. Uh, uh, expressed some some uh, heartburn there, which he very quickly walked back. Yeah, he was he at first was very sharply critical when it went public with some critical statements, and then he withdrew from that. And we want to get into why that might have happened. Well, well, he he, he made this. This was at a, a town hall meeting, and he talked about the transportation <laughs> bill, and then he talked about the Braves Bridge that goes across. I-285. And there's going to be, you're going to need some state cooperation on that Braves Bridge. So, so uh, you know, this, the transportation is an incredibly linked topic. Okay, well, let, let's hold that because I do think it's interesting to see how these local officials are being a little more cautious uh, about this than maybe their initial instinct would have them be. But before we get there, uh, Howard Franklin, uh, Pat St. Clair, asked uh, uh, Chairman Roberts, uh, asked uh, Roberts, uh, is this a little bit of a shell game? And he said, no, of course not, because we're not raising taxes. And if local governments want to, that's up to them. Of course, of course. Well, I mean, I think she used... <laughs> 
uh, the right terminology in this case. I mean, essentially, the, the bill does take money from the pockets of local government. And, uh, and it says if you'd like to replace that with tax dollars, you're welcome to do so. I think whatever pushback we see initially will be based, you know, in cities and counties where we know budgets have been shrinking, where we know federal support's been shrinking. And, you know, there's just as many needs for the local services that they provide as this big one in, in transportation. Eric, you, you um, uh, uh, know how these things work. And are local <coughs> officials being a little cautious in their criticism now? Because they're not sure exactly how this is all going to unfold. Sure, sure. But I'm, I'm encouraged by this because I think we now finally have a proposal that's been put out there that's a starting point. And I think that these legislators are going to hear from people back home. And it's going to allow them to start looking at whether this is the right proposal or we'll see what the Senate does. One thing that I found very encouraging was, was Tommy Williams, Senator Williams, saying that the, the $100 million for transit, I mean, you now have agreement. Uh, Incredible. Uh, right. I mean, you would not, not have heard this three the years ago. The fact that right. there is agreement, they need $100 right. million right. for no, transit. That they need transit. Right. right. Well, that's what I mean. Yeah, exactly. And so at least you know you're starting at $100 million. Okay, but, but, buddy, what I'm hearing in Eric's comments uh, is that this could all be transformed as it moves through the legislative process. Well, this I should hope it'll be transformed because <laughs> this is the ultimate shell game. Uh, it's voodoo economics. It is really a farce as far as I'm concerned. And what I can't understand is with the Republicans holding super majorities in the House and the Senate, the governor, lieutenant governor, and every other office in the state, why don't they just man up and say this is what we need to do and go ahead and pass the legislation we need? It's the first term, first a year Which of government what? deals term. So you, let's man up and go so, ahead but, but the and, and pass the, answer the tax. To, the answer to your question is because you've got 31 members of the House of a 119-member Republican caucus who have signed uh, Grover Norquist's anti-tax pledge. That leaves plenty more. And it's time for some leadership <laughs> rather than just sitting back and, and twiddling our thumbs here because we have a unique opportunity in this state because we realize the need for it and we're sitting back twiddling our thumbs but you're and doing only, nothing. I'm sorry for interrupting. You're the only one uh, in this group tonight who's actually been an elected member of uh, Congress. Right. Uh, so how did, what was your feeling about voting to raise taxes while you were in office? Did you, I didn't like it. And I did it more than once because you got to put the national interest where, first. Where did you in Congress. vote to raise taxes? And, and, can you uh, remind us of Big Bill? Oh, oh, let's see, 1994, for example, uh, and 93, uh, two different times. Okay. And also George Bush. I was just going to ask you, you Bush, did vote so, on that one. So on, on uh, at least three different occasions. But every now and then you've got to put what's best for the country. But how do constituents react to that? Oh, oh, they, they, they did, of course, didn't like it, but for the most part, pe the voters are smarter than we give them credit for being. I totally the agree, voters buddy. will understand what needs to be done. And here okay. we're taking away $500 million from state and local, from local governments and school systems. Yeah. And school well, systems. It, it feels like the leadership, Republican leadership, wants to have it both ways. They want to say we're making an investment, but really they're just moving money from one account to another and then asking the folks who we took the money from to raise taxes on the backs of those same But go governing is not easy. And the Democratic convention was last weekend, buddy. But, you know, when you're in the majority, you have to make tough decisions. And I think that this is the start of a process. And we're having but you, a healthy this, this debate. Was this was designed to move a bill out of the House chamber right. with the majority support of Republicans. I'd love to see Zell Miller get a hold of this crowd. Well, wait, wait. <laughs> but, but explain that for our, our well, viewers. Just, just generally <laughs> speaking, uh, we govern through, a, the, the legislature is governed through a Republican prism. If it cannot pass a House Republican caucus meeting or a Senate Republican caucus meeting, it doesn't move. This was designed to pass a Republican caucus. But are you suggesting it's a shell that's put in place to get it moving and then could transform itself into something far different? I think the transformation different? is natural. <laughs> You're going to have you're going to have a bill move from the House to the Senate. Tommy Williams has all, already said, uh, given some indications that he's going to have some from fa some fairly serious changes. They will they will take care of their business. It will move to the conference committee, and that's when you'll really see us get down to business right. on this. Right, and there'll be a lot of educating that'll happen between now and then when you get to that point. But that's why I go back to the. It was very telling that Tommy Williams 
concurred with the transit money because now you're starting to see already some things where there's agreement. There's you, not. You have you have the House Speaker saying we need transit. You have Jay Roberts saying we right. need transit. I've I've my I have had a change in heart. It's uh, right. This is pretty this amazing. Is, this is pretty amazing. But that's only a hundred million out of a billion. And it and and it's it it means very little in terms of financing because you've got, uh, I think Jay Roberts says, we've got 128 transit systems out mm -hmm. there. That means less than a million. You think you think $800,000 <laughs> matters to Martin? No, it doesn't. And also there, federal there matching be, money There will be other be stuff placed on the table here. Okay, yeah. um, let's move on if we can. Uh, one of the things that uh, we talked about in the uh, headlines for this show is the fact that Democrats are starting to plant their feet a little bit and say, you want our our help on some of the big issues, we're not ready to come to the table quite yet, Governor Deal or uh, House uh, Republican leaders. This weekend, Jim Galloway, the Democrats had their state convention and uh, they elected, re-elected their chair, DeBose Porter. We could talk about that for a second if we'd like in a moment. But uh, there was harsh language coming out from that convention. Maybe you expect it because it is a political convention, but one of the things that got a lot of criticism uh, was uh, the governor's education plan, his plan to be able to take over failing school systems, and uh, he needs Democrats on that one. Vincent Fort had some really uh, harsh uh, comments uh, uh, to make. He, he, at one point, uh, Vincent Fort said, uh, giving Nathan Deal a school system run is like giving a drunk the keys to the car. Now, we expect that kind of language from him, <laughs> but, but nevertheless, harsh language. What's going on? Well, I think, number one, you do have a, you, that, that was a red meat for him, and, and, and they tossed out the red sure. meat, and, and everyone uh, bit. Uh, it also contrasts with the way that the governor is actually working this deal. He is having some very quiet meetings with, with, uh, with Democrats and Republicans who are kind of queasy about this thing. Uh, he has planned a trip to New Orleans with a delegation. Uh, three Republicans, three Democrats. Because Louisiana and New Orleans has adopted this plan. Louisiana. These are, these are the opportunity, oppor opportunity schools right. that he's talking about. He's also very, very narrowly focused this things. We're not talking about school systems anymore, and I think that's a big change. We are talking about the state takeover of individual, individual schools. schools. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's that very tellingly, that, that, that school takeover would be a direct report to the governor not to the state school superintendent. So Democrats were, at, well, Vincent Fort, at least, was very tough about this. But is this really a partisan issue at all? I mean, isn't this something across this partisan line? Well, I, I can't think... understand it because Republicans are supposed to be for local control. And here we are wanting to do a massive uh, takeover of whether it's a school system or individual schools. That's a big step. I'm not saying that... Uh, it might not be justified under some certain circumstances, well, I but I can understand why people will have grave reservations about well, it. Well, I think you look at what happened in DeKalb County and the good work of what, what the governor did stepping in, working with uh, Superintendent Thurman and how that district has, has turned around. But I do think that you do need to separate out Senator Fort from some of the other legislators, because Stacey Abrams, uh, as the minority leader in the House, has been very deliberative in the way she's handling herself and, and, and leading her caucus, and they're not getting out in front, uh, you know, with all the, you know, rhetoric that, that Vincent Fort um, is out there. You're right. I love Vincent Fort, but he is our attack dog. <laughs> but, uh, and, and, and just, this is, this is another issue. This is a constitutional amendment uh, requirement. Right. We'd have to have a two-thirds vote right. in each chamber. And... That gets, uh, the, uh, the Republicans are close to it, but I think the issue of local control and would would peel off a few of those. I, I've, heard, will be needed. I've heard the exact same thing. I think local control is going to be a, the big elephant in the room. I think I've heard from Republicans who are even concerned about what this might mean. But I, I'm cautious about comparing this to, say, that the cab schools take over, only because you were looking at a board there and you did leave some folks in place. And then you also, it seemed to be a much more even-handed process. So you had a Democrat, who, you know, who had served for many years as the labor commissioner who came in and led the system. And I, I think they did get good results. But the question here, the devil here is in the details. Details. Will this proposal take over schools individually? Will it put them in a receivership? Will it allow someone else to run them? Will policies change in some other ways? And I think but why isn't question. what happened in DeKalb an awfully good model for the kind of methodical and fair-minded way? Did the, 
did the governor show that he could do this methodically and fit in a fair-minded way? I do think in this individual mm -hmm. instance, yes. I think he found, you know, uh, board members of both partisan stripes. I think there was a lot of media attention. I think doing this one at a time might be doable. But to take all, you know, the hundreds of school systems that are there, the hundreds of schools and not thousands, but, of but, students. But we're not talking about. We're right. talking about identifying failing schools. Yes, but 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 you really have to be careful about right. how you define that trigger. What is a failing school? Because, I mean, in, his, in a State of the State ex, uh, uh, speech, uh, Deal said that 23 percent of Georgia school systems either get a D or an F right. for over the last three years. That would meet one definition. And if you just took 1 percent of all of Georgia schools, that's still 24 schools. I think that's still too much for the governor to handle. Okay. okay. This issue transcends partisan politics. It's it a lot bigger than that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I want to, we're going to take a break, but when we come back, um, I'm going to gra grab you. We talked about the Democratic Convention. Okay. I want to turn to you, Howard, uh, and talk to you about what happened in the election, the re-election of DeBose Porter. We'll do that when we come back. Still ahead on lawmakers, we'll talk about that, but also Representative Alan Peek takes to Facebook to build grassroots support for his medical marijuana bill. Back with that and more in just a moment. Representative Scott Turner is a Republican from Holly Springs. He represents House District 21. Turner was sworn into the Georgia General Assembly in 2013. He's serious, he says, about his role as a public servant. He faithfully updates his Facebook page for his constituents and he lists his cell number for everyone to see. A father of two, Turner says he and his family enjoy geocaching, a high-tech version of treasure hunting using GPS and other navigational clues. Stay tuned for more Lawmakers. In addition to the Speaker of the House, there are three other important House leadership roles the majority leader, the minority leader, and the floor leader. The majority leader is responsible for advancing the agenda of the majority party in the House, while the minority leader does the same for the minority party. The floor leader promotes the governor's interests in the chamber. Welcome back to Lawmakers. I'm Bill Nygut. Here with us tonight, Howard Franklin, Democratic political strategist, Buddy Darden, former Democratic member of the U.S. House from Cobb County. Jim Galloway, longtime political reporter for the AJC, political insider, is his hour-by-hour uh, -hour blog of what's happening in uh, politics in Georgia and beyond. And Eric Tannenblatt, Republican uh, political advisor. Um, I said, Howard, that I wanted to get your quick take on the re-election of DeBose Porter, state Democratic Party chair. There was controversy after the election last uh, November that he may not have used the resources in a way that uh, helped the party. It was especially focused on whether or not the Democrats did a good enough job reaching out to black voters. It got very heated. What's your take on DuBose Porter <clears throat> having a second term? Well, I'll say two things to that. One, he was filling an unexpired term from uh, previous chair Mike Berlon, so it's tough to get a, an accurate reading on exactly what he would have done over the four years, but I, I don't... I think uh, former congressman and former presidential candidate Jack Kemp said the best way to get rid of a bad idea is to replace it with a good one. I don't know that Democrats here in Georgia have come up with a lot of good ideas uh, to figure out how to go forward. I, I will say one of the dirty little secrets in Democratic politics, I'm not sure how true it is in Republican politics, is that so much of what happens on the campaign, particularly when you've got a national election or a big election for U.S. Senate or governor, it's not really dictated by the party. It's very much, much more so dictated by the candidates and the, the advisors who raise the millions of dollars and use the party as a pass-through. So it's tough to, to lay all the blame at the party's feet, knowing that it didn't really have operational control of how this, the money Well, was okay, spent. but let me stay with Democrats on this one. Buddy, as you well know, there were, there were uh, people, uh, uh, Theron Johnson, Kasim Reed, who uh, were quite angry that they didn't feel enough money was put into uh, getting black voters registered, getting them to the polls, that sort of thing. Do you think, that's, that's yesterday's story, do you think they've all come together and are going to be able to move forward together as a unified party? I think we're lucky to have DuBose Porter on the job. It's a tough job and uh, it's tough to getting somebody to come in and do it. I think he did the best he could under the circumstances. That's always going to be a lot of dissatisfaction when you lose. 
and having been on the losing side, there's always ways you can say we should have done this, we should have done that. But really, I just do not think it was in the cards. Look at nationally. We lost something like 900 legislators nationally. So we got wiped out this last time. You, 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 you vote to increase just, taxes, you're going to lose, buddy. Is, yeah. the, are the, is the X <laughs> buried on this thing? No, no, because I don't, I don't, I don't think it's, I don't think it's a person versus person acts here. I think okay. what you have is a, 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 a spending controversy. Whether you you focus all you, what money you have on television, or whether you focus fair, it on grass. Fair rates. way to say that. There's still a philosophical difference on that. And I think there will be. Okay. All right. Let's move on. Alan Peake uh, posted on Facebook uh, this post in which he uh, said uh, that he needs help. He wants to make sure that people who support his medical marijuana bill will reach out to the Sheriff's Association, to the Prosecuting Attorneys Council, those are the DAs around the state, tell them that they need to support his bill, which has now a list of uh, conditions that would qualify for medical marijuana. Jim Galloway, is this a sign that that legislation is facing some stiff opposition? I think it's a sign that despite having 100 signatures on that House bill, that the prosecutors and sheriffs in Georgia still have enough political clout, these are elected officials, that they can take it down. They can take down a bill when they want to. So what's the what's the what do you imagine? Do you, is it a matter of paring back the list I, of conditions? Absolutely. Yeah. I think I think what he, what what Alan Peak is going to have to do is is uh, sit down with Chuck Spahos and maybe the, somebody from the Sheriff's Association. Spahos is the executive director of the Prosecutors Council, and see what what they're uncomfortable with. Um, Eric, you know. He, 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 this is clearly a bill that operate comes from compassion. Sure. It started with uh, Alan Peake uh, uh, feeling strongly about helping uh, children with seizure disorders. Now he's expanded that list of conditions to include various kinds of cancer, terminal illnesses, um, I, I, I think um, Crohn's disease. Mm -hmm. Where do you draw the line on compassion? How do you suddenly cut back and say some diseases deserve this and others don't? Well, I mean, he's done his work and they've studied this. And uh, and now, uh, you know, while you have some of the um, the sheriffs and district attorneys who have stepped forward, I, I think you're also going to get a lot of these families that have kids that are going to step forward. And I think what um, what's, what Representative Peake is doing, you know, trying to mobilize the grassroots, you'll, you'll the legislators are just going to start hearing from people back home. He's too. been very good at mobilizing <laughs> grassroots support Absolutely. all he should, along. He should really be applauded. I mean, the way he has handled <clears throat> this going through from, from when he be, first became educated to this past year uh, has been quite remarkable. Buddy, is there still this sense of marijuana as the demon weed that stands in the way of this a compassionate use of marijuana? I can't understand it. When 49% of the people, according to the polls, approve the use of marijuana for recreational use, then we can't even get it passed for these very, very difficult situations. Uh, I just can't understand it. I think there's going to be a groundswell of people to come in, support mm -hmm. Representative Peake here, and say, enough of this nonsense and foolishness. Let's All right. Move on. We're going to have to leave it there. We're out of time for tonight. Buddy Darden, Eric Tannenblatt, Jim Galloway, and Howard Franklin, great to have all four of you uh, here for Political Rewind. That's day nine of the 2015 legislative session. We're going to be back tomorrow night with all the latest news from the state capitol. We invite you to send your thoughts to us, lawmakers at gpb.org. Thanks so much for being with us tonight for this Groundhog's Day edition of Lawmakers. <laughs> By the way, Speaker Ralston saw his shadow today when he stepped out of the well, which I guess it means at least six more weeks of the session. Have a great evening. This is a GPB original production.